Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Hope you're having a good week and hope that you are still savoring an incredible hunting season. Face it, no matter how it went, it went better than not hunting, didn't it? Amen to that. Great show in store for you. Tim Linehan will join us. We're going to talk forest grouse in Montana. Some tips for anybody who chases birds in the trees. He's got some great advice on all three of the forest species that he hunts out there that will be of value to everybody else. We'll talk about all the things we like about hunting, particularly dog work. Find out who owns and who doesn't own an RV. In our dog training segment, a pro trainer, I'll call it a trick that we ignore most of the time to our detriment. And in our public access segment, we'll talk about Bob White's and a hidden gem in that world. So uh, stick around for all of that and more. I was shooting a video a couple days ago and it reminded me of one of the fundamental lessons I've, I keep relearning. And I'll bring it up again later in the broadcast, but um, sloppy retrieves. You know, I needed Flick to do some really good work on the training table. And uh, hopefully by the time we're done with this video, it'll look like he did it right. <laughs> yeah, but you can blame it on the trainer. <clears throat> Maybe you're working on that stuff now. This is the time of year when we... We think back on all the things we wish we had done better during the season, and that's kind of my life in a nutshell right now. Flick's uh, biggest issue is sloppy retrieves. Thanks to my bad shooting, he didn't get a lot of experience to practice on. We're not all the way back to square one, but we're probably on about square two. Are you working on something in particular? Maybe it is retrieving maybe it's steadiness yeah we're going to work on that again as well the pigeons are multiplying slowly but surely i don't know if you raise pigeons have you noticed this is a strange year strange winter in that i've had pigeons laying eggs and hatching chicks all year i've got six birds on nests right now and i got three squeakers already on three of those nests so Take a look. It's weird to me, but I'm not a, a real pigeon guy. I just raise them to use for dog training. How about you? Well, you know, uh, we hunt for many reasons. But the top three are dog work, being in beautiful places, and hanging out with people we like. Friends and family. Camaraderie. And this week on the Facebook pages, I asked... Uh, you to show me a picture or tell me a story about uh, dog work, dog training, whatever else you're doing with your dog. And boy, did I get some great responses. Kyle Stein's short hair. Man, that looks like a magazine cover point during a shed hunt. Found a covey of quail. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Kent Huso, beardy dog right there, getting some rewards and some uh, retrieves on pheasants in the water. And what a shot. Uh, Kent, that's a magazine cover shot as well. It looks just great. Blue, crystal blue water in the front. There's a dog about halfway out in the weeds, working through just like a nav to duck search. Blue sky, which is probably why the water's blue too. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Rebecca Burkhardt. Pretty happy with her baby bird dog way up on top. I, I see the top of that hill. I can't see the dog way up there. That's a chucker hunt right out of my own playbook. And uh, your dog, six and a half months old, holding a covey of chucker while you plot it all the way up there. It probably took a while, didn't it? Beautiful. Uh, almost, uh, I, think, I think what Tad, my director, calls a uh, sunburst. A lot, you know, like rays coming out of the sun off on the left side and another bluebird sky and then classic chucker habitat in the foreground, uh, sagebrush, 
and lots of cheat grass. That was my experience all season. Lots of cheat grass is where you found the birds. James Falconer, congratulations. James says he's been trying to break his red setter from creeping all winter. Finally got a couple nice points on wild hen pheasants. But they were already pinned from the foot of snow. And he's counting the days to woodcock season already. Hey, that's a good-looking dog there. Uh, clearly a field-bred line because the uh, the feathering is nice and short. If you own a long-haired dog, you can appreciate that as much as I can. All right. Uh, Tim Linehan is standing by on the line from Yak, Montana. We'll be talking about forest grouse and other things of value to everybody out there from protocol to strategy right after this quick break for a couple commercial messages. First one, Sage and Breaker gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. You know that. If you're looking for heirloom quality gun care gear, that's where you find it, sageandbreaker.com. Always free shipping. Watch the videos. You'll learn something. And you'll learn about how to get the good stuff all at sageandbreaker.com. And if you can't get it there, you can get it at uplandnationdeals.com. Seems like any time we get a listing for a great electronic training collar, it's on there for 48 hours and then it's gone. So if you're shopping for one, check it out. And if you're trying to unload some of your unused gear, it's a great place to go uplandnationdeals.com So I said yak, but yak is uh, one of the places you can hunt three species of forest grouse in one day with Orvis endorsed wing shooting guide Tim Linehan Tim, Tim, how are things in uh, Troy, Montana, which I guess is your home base? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it is. It, it, things are wonderful, Scott. No complaints. Um, nice winter, good snowpack. That's good for the for the fishing that's about to come on uh, come online here in another week or two. Uh, Troy is Troy is where our mail comes from, but I literally do live in the Yak Valley. I am talking to you from 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 the middle of central, literally right in the middle of the Yak Valley here in northwest Montana. It's a spectacular area. I only wish I could spend a little more time there. Why don't you uh, tell us how you ended up in in the Yak Valley? I mean, you don't sound like you're from Montana. Oh, no. no. I grew up in New Hampshire. <laughs> and uh, you, you can take the kid out of New England, but uh, you can't take the accent out of the kid, as they say, or the Boston Red Sox either, for that matter. But um I was, I was, this is back in 1989, I was a, let's see, I think I was a few years out of the University of New Hampshire, and I was, um, I, uh, I grew up hunting and fishing, Scott, like a lot of, like a lot of young people, and um, just went crazy for it, and the short story is, this was before computers, before, you know, smartphones, before all of that stuff, I opened the back of Fly Fisherman magazine with a dream, a fantasy, and I thought, you know, I'm not a bad fly fisherman, I, I've been doing it for, you know, since I was, 16 or 17 years old, very, very seriously, um, and I was 25 or something like that, and so I thought, you know, I wonder about the chances of, of going to Montana being a fly fishing guide for the for the spring, summer, and fall, so I opened the back of Fly Fisherman magazine, I sent out a couple of resumes, and I'm sitting in my little house in New Hampshire with a buddy, and uh, holy mackerel, I get a phone call, and this guy says, sure, kid, come on out, and so I um, I thought I was headed for Twin Bridges, Montana, and then and then the, the short story is a friend of a friend, a guy who knows a guy said, I know <laughs> I know this place. There's a guy I know up in Yak, Montana, supposed to be this unbelievably wild place, one of the last wild places left in the low 48 states, and you can swing by there uh, on your way to uh, you know Twin Bridges. And I thought, well, that sounds like an adventure. So I drove out to Yak right here in 1989, January of 1989. And I had a place to stay for the winter, and I thought, well, I'll spend the winter in this place called Yak and snow, snowshoe and cross-country ski and pound around in this beautiful country and head down to Twin Bridges, Montana in in the springtime, and that was 32 years ago, and I never left Yak. So, Did you get lost? Or you, you... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. Heck, a, heck of a left turn, as yeah. they say. Right? 
Well, you know, uh, as you well know, Twin Bridges is a wonderful place. I've actually made television shows there. But, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. But so, yeah. so is Yak. I mean, the, the few times I've been there, I've been um, dazzled by it. And clearly, so are you. What is it about that area that, that gets you so excited? And, and just to make clear, you came to be a fly fishing guide, and, and you're still doing that. In fact, your website is fishmontana.com. But you're also guiding hunters, and so tell me a little bit about the uh, about the upland bird hunting situation and why it's so intriguing to you. Yeah, well, so the reason I think I got here, I mean, this is very, very different from maybe the rest of Montana. This isn't traditional big sky country. This is much more like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, uh, this is it is a temperate rain catalog, you know classified as a temperate rainforest, which in, unto itself, as you well know, Scott, is very unusual for Montana. Uh, this looks and smells much more like the Cascades going toward your, you know, going, going over toward Washington State, toward your area, parts of Oregon. Uh, smells like Christmas all the time. This is big, deep timber, conifers. Um, and it's also logging country. And so, as you well know, logging country is terrific. Um, Multi-age species forests are terrific for grouse. In this case, three species of grouse. So we've got lots of, you know, good populations of rough grouse. We have spruce grouse and we have blue grouse now called sooty or dusky. I can't even remember, but uh, in good numbers. And, and, and um, so that's why, you know, I grew up hunting grouse too. I grew up, I mean, I, I, I came to Montana sort of with the idea of becoming a fly fisherman because it was a little more accessible, but I also grew up, I've been a, I've been a crazy hunter, both big game and, and, um, and um, you know, um, grouse hunting, bird hunting for, forever as well. But, but I think, you know, I got here and it was just amazing to me that first of all, there were three, three species of wild grouse. Um, and, and I love pheasant. I love chucker. Uh, Sharpies are always going to have a special place in my heart. But you grow up in New England and you're kind of crazy for roughed grouse and to throw in spruce and, and um, blue grouse, which behave pretty similarly to that end. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it was yeah. just sort of this, this magical, unbelievable place like holy mackerel. Here's all this country and and, and annually, we don't necessarily have the same fluctuations in populations. I would assume, um, Scott, that that's largely due to the abundance of available habitat. You know what I mean? I mean, I think, I think in some places, you know, you get those, those swings of population, particularly roughed grouse uh, across the Midwest and into New England. I think a lot of that has to do with habitat, aspens, poplar. But there's just so much habitat here. Um, generally speaking, we usually have pretty good populations. So, well, you, you know, you, you, you mentioned that, and, and you're getting me in the mood right now. You said it smells, <laughs> smells like Christmas all the time. So I'm thinking about the west side of Oregon where I spent significant time and remembering just all like of that. that. Yep, yeah. Just like that. But, but uh, the habitat differences are, you believe, at least in part, are, are, are one of the reasons the populations are more steady. Describe the differences between, say, an upper Midwest and a northeastern U.S. Uh, grouse habitat and what you have out there, types of trees and what else. Yeah, that, so, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. i uh, love to dig into this. So growing up in New England, or let's just talk about New England and Midwest, which I know a little bit about, um, you know, habitat for, for let's, and let's just stick with rust. And rust and spruce very much overlap, same sort of habitat for the most part. But, you know, growing, New England it, it is all about edges and those fields and with a, with, a, with a forested edge and stone walls and new growth that might be poplar and, and um, you know, maple, maple whips and, you know, that, that sort of stuff. What, what is different here is, um, this is this is, for the most part, a lot of conifers. And, and one of the things that I noticed when I first got here is it's still the, that classic new growth so that wouldn't be any different from New England. It's just going to be a different species. But the classic new growth here would it would be um, lodgepole pine and and dug fir and 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 hemlock and things like that 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 were that were you know they were clear cuts 30 years ago, Scott. That's the important piece. And now they're a nice mix of that edge, right? Grouse are definitely an edge species, right? Or can be or prefer that as a part of their habitat. Uh, w always with a spring seep 
but but it is i often tell people it is mostly conifers i mean people are sometimes surprised to see so many rough grouse so many spruce grouse blue grouse a little bit different but in in primarily conifers now does that mean that i don't go looking for the alder thicket um early in the season when temperatures might be 60 65 during the day sure that's exactly where they're going to be in the cover right that piece isn't going to change but instead of the cover being you know primarily poplar uh, maple whippets and things like that. This is going to be primarily lodgepole pine uh, with some brush and and blow down and 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 that's going to make up 75% of the cover instead of instead of what you might see in you know compared to New England or the Upper Midwest. And we know they're called spruce grouse because that is a primary aspect of their diet certain times of year. But um, well, how does that affect the the diet and then the behavior of 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 the roughies and the blues and the spruce grouse for that matter? Yeah, so 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 that's also a great question. The the spruce grouse for sure. When I say that spruce grouse and rough grouse, you know, sort of um, overlap, they do. I mean, there are a lot of covers. I mean, I can tell guys, hey guys, dog goes on point. You know, perhaps get ready for a roughy to blow out of there or get ready for a sprucer. You'll have to go in there and kick around a little bit because they're typically not necessarily as wild flyers as a roughy would be, mm-hmm. or blue for that matter. Yeah. But, but to, to, to answer the question, um, it's the, 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 the spruce grouse will definitely be in a little thicker, a little bit darker part of the cover. That part is true. And it doesn't mean they don't stray out onto one of the old logging roads to get gravel. It doesn't mean they don't stray out onto the edge as well. You know what I mean? But, but day in and day out, if someone says, hey, Tim, I'd really like to see a couple of spruce grouse, I'll dive into the thicker, darker part of the cover that may be laid up against literally some spruce, right? That, 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 your, to your sure, point, they are yeah. called spruce grouse, yeah. Uh, and then, but, but nobody, nobody doesn't eat, none of those species won't eat berries early in the year, Scott. None of that changes. They won't eat, you know, none of those, n- none of the three will never get off insects, berries, and, and, and greenery. In this case, it's going to be clover and kinnikinnik. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, kinnikinnik, uh, both the berries and also the greenery, right? But n- all three of those species over in my country, that will be the primary diet on the front end of the season. As the season starts to move along, to your point, both spruce and um, sooties, blue grouse definitely start to come along and, and grab a bunch more, you know, needles, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of unusual, really. I mean, it's pretty amazing that, that, uh, they can make a living on conifer needles really on one level, you know, it's kind of interesting. Mm, and taste great too. Just like turpentine. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so let's get back to the, the the difference in the trees. We get it, you know. Instead of alders and and aspens and that sort of thing, uh, for the most part, when and we're generalizing here because you know the, that's correct. Yeah, when, that's when, correct. When I'm hunting uh, roughies out here in the Cascades, I would kill to find uh, you know a stand of aspens or some streamside alders or something like that. But if it's primarily conifers. Yeah, uh, the same rule hold true, you know, in terms of the aging of those stands and where you're going to find birds that are going to be in the very young tree stands and that sort of thing. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Dead on. Exactly. Okay. That's the so that's the piece I think that I maybe maybe that's what I was trying to articulate. That part will never change. Yep. Now, unless, as I said, we're, you know, you're diving in specifically looking for a sprucer, or it's a hot day, you dive into the dark part of the cover to hunt grouse. Period. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But, yeah. but, but that is correct. That absolutely true. Yep. So, um, tell us. Uh, let, let let let's talk about roughies because that's going to be the kind of the universal species for most of us. Uh, what are these birds doing in the course of a day? Tell me how, how their life yeah. goes. Yep. So, 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 so typically here, uh, you know, the, during the early part of the season, you know, we can still be pretty mild. Um, I run my, my wing shooting program. I specifically, season opens September 1, Scott, but mm-hmm. I specifically don't start until the middle of September, September 15-ish, and I'll do about 30 straight days into the middle of October. Then we roll over to big game. Um, but we can still be mild on the front end of the season. And so during the early, let's just stick with the front of the season, birds are pretty, they'll, they'll be moving in the mornings. Absolutely. This is, again, generalizing, right, which w- w- sure. works pretty well for hunting sometimes. Um, they will definitely feed a little bit in the morning. You will get them out on berries. You will have them out in, you know, 
generally speaking, a little bit more of the open edges in these covers, still in conifers for the most part, right? This is not, not going to change up here in my country. Okay. Uh, and then during the early part of the season, they'll lay up for the day. I mean, they can be really tough. That's then when I tell people we're going to go basically briar busting, what we used to call it back in New Hampshire. Here, we're just going to go, you know, deeper and darker into the timber, for, you know, trying to, trying to find them, trying to get them to fly uh, during, during the middle part of the day. And then again, Typically, right, they're going to move as soon as the sun goes down, which in middle September is, you know, 6.30-ish, something like that, 5.30, 6 o'clock. They will start to move again. They will come back and feed, or uh, they will move maybe to the, you know, to the edges, come out on the old gravel logging roads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to try and get some grit for the, you know, for the night. You know, I, I, I've only asked this once or twice, and I don't think I've gotten a definitive answer. These birds are never going to come to water for water, are they? No, they don't really have to. I mean, that's yeah. the one thing about grouse. Yeah, so, so, so the, the one thing about grouse get plenty of moisture. It's been proven over and over and over, and I think it got started. You know, there were some studies quite a while ago, actually, that grouse of the North Shore, um, great book. They get plenty of moisture from what they eat. And yeah. berries, you know, you, you snap a berry any time in September. You snap a berry in your fingers. It doesn't matter what the berry is. It's pretty, it's pretty loaded with fluid. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. That's Tim Linehan. Fishmontana.com is where you learn more about all the guiding he does, including fishing. Uh, but we're talking rough grouse here at the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. And then those other two or three. If you're a splitter, there's duskies and there's sooties. If you're a lumper, they're all sooties. <laughs> I'm not sure now <laughs> right. that argument will go on. Actually, they'll probably change their mind again. The American <laughs> Ornithological yeah. Union or whoever makes those decisions. Anyway. Um, uh, so what's in your dog string, Tim? So, yeah. So, so love, love to talk about the girls. I've got uh, right now I've got, I run primarily setters for, for many years. I always had probably still will, but, um, I always had some retrievers as well, and golden retrievers, and I got small golden retrievers for many years. I always had some golden retrievers also, but I've kind of rolled over where we've got uh, we've got an aging retriever lying at my feet right now, but we've got, uh, for the most part, not for the most part, but we've got a, I've got setters rolling and probably going to get another one here in another year or so, try and keep them a couple years apart for all obvious reasons. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So um, when you, are, are you getting these dogs as puppies, or are you bringing them on as they're started? Yeah, no. So, so that's an interesting, uh, interesting thought, Scott. I, I almost did a starter dog this past two. Well, this this, this puppy Lucy's going to be eighteen months, but no. So I have always gotten dogs as puppies, and I, I do. Uh, maybe I'm old school. I just I really like that piece of it. I you know some people don't have patience for puppies. Joanne and I love having puppies rolling around the house and knocking stuff over and you know that's part of that's part of that's part of life we kind of enjoy that chaos hey, and, and <laughs> but, just um, a, just a note an editorial note here that never ends right, right. <laughs> for those of you who are wondering <laughs> yeah, exactly i say that as if i say that as, as if it sometimes is over right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah but I, I i kind of i'm not a trainer scott you and i talked about that yeah. i what I know, I do. I, I say with confidence, although never brag on your dogs, or they'll break your heart. Um, I, I teach obedience. I teach my dogs. I, I help my dogs learn to stay close, which is very effective for me in this country. And um, and then literally, I just train them on wild birds. I just put them down as puppies. I'll put a puppy down. I'll get it, you know get all my puppies in the springtime. And I'll put them on the ground the first season, and yeah, they'll kind of they'll run with the big dogs, and then I'll put them down by their own. And usually, you know, you by the breeder, we all know that by the breeder. Um, and usually, I'll get a couple of few good points their first year, and they're no more than seven or eight months old. And so, I just believe in getting them on the ground, um, helping them learn not to chase bunnies, stay close. We're not out here to run deer. You know what I mean? That, that, that's mm -hmm. the, those are the. That's about the, you know, if I'm a trainer, that's what I do with confidence these days, Scott. But I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm, I'm not the guy that has a barrel out there and teaching, you know, working very, very hard and diligently twice a day. And I, I just, I frankly don't have time. I would love to. Uh, I would love to be able to do that someday and just see how far you can take it. But um, I, I would say that my dogs are maybe much more utilitarian and they do a great job and they find birds and they point birds. And once in a while, <laughs> once in a while we hit one. 
Well, good. And and hopefully once in a while they bring them back too. That right? too, yes. So, so too. What, are those, <laughs> you know, fundamentally, Tim, are those your expectations? Point them, bring them back. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that that works good for me, you know, and, and I don't, I, I don't, it, it, this puppy that I got, this puppy we just got, she may be steady to, to wing and shot. Uh, I don't even, I try my best as we are, as we are literally learning together, Scott, but for instance, I wouldn't even, you know, I often tell my clients, guys, they may or may not be steady to wing and shot, just be, so be super careful, it's just a little bird, that's all, we're going to see more, right, no sense in, and doing something dumb in a low shot or any of that stuff. Um, but this puppy of mine, she's showing, you know, great inclination, super, super steady. But to, to answer the question specifically, that is really all I need up here. That is really all that I believe a dog is, yeah. is, is, yeah. Um, is necessary for on one level. Sure, if you have the time and the inclination, uh, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'd love to be out there twice a, you know, twice a day for a half hour working on a barrel and doing, you know, doing all the, all the stuff that you read about and, and watch YouTube videos about. And, but, but I don't have time, and, and basically I need my dogs to, first of all, hunt really, really well, hunt really, really hard, and know that we're a team. And after that, like you said, point them, find them for me. Sometimes, sometimes they bring them back. Sometimes they'll just go flash point them, but I don't care. That's fine. She'll just stand over the bird, and I don't mind going over and picking it up. That's good, too. Yeah, because it's not usually in a, in a grouse hunt. It's not uphill the whole time. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, beepers versus bells versus anything. Yeah, great, <laughs> great, great conversation. Um, I have really been appreciative of beepers in my country. It's pretty thick. Uh, I hate the noise. It's kind of anti being in the wilderness. You know what I mean? It's just kind of that electronic thing. But uh, again, from a utilitarian point of view, I like a beeper. I know where they are at all times. Um, I'll admit I was a little late to GPS callers. I just got a couple two years ago. I love those as well. I like the beepers because we can hear them. The other reason I like the beeper, Scott, is we have a lot of predators. Well, we, we are, this is wild country and we have big predators. I've never had an issue. I may never have an issue, but we do have mountain lions. We do have wolves. We've got a fair number of coyotes. Um, I, I want a little more significant noise out there while we're hunting. Just you know, better safe than sorry to that end. Yeah. I, I never thought about that, but it is a little bit of an insurance policy. You're it is. It is, right. and, and you know, and, and, and if I can hear it at 100 yards, then everything else can hear it at yeah. 300 or 500, yeah. right? And I think that's not a bad idea in this kind of country. Yeah. You know, and I've I've had uh, luckily not an experience like that, but I've had one with a raccoon that that reminded me. Boy, I wish somebody would take a GPS collar and on top of everything else, put a beeper on it. Yeah. Because I've right. stood there and it's yep. told me my dog is right at my feet and I still can't find him. Right, right, right. Yep. So, yep. Um, okay, if anybody's yep. listening out there, please do that <laughs> for, for me and for Tim, too, by the way. Amen, um, amen brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just getting warmed up here at the Upland Nation podcast. Tim Linehan is with fishmontana.com, and that is a misnomer for today. He's an Orvis endorsed wing shooting guide. If you know anything about that program, you don't just get that, you earn it. And Tim has done exactly that. In fact, Tim. Let's talk briefly about that. Um, how does that happen? I, I'm pretty familiar with it, but tell people what what you do to bec become Orvis endorsed. Yeah, so 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 it's a it's a great program. I, it's been very very good for us. I, I, I would I would be I would be I'd be straight, Scott. It's not for everybody. It depends on who yeah. you are and what yeah. you're looking for, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's a wonderful wonderful program. It's been it's been nothing but terrific for Joanne and I. Um, and our crew, the, the, it's not easy. I say this with humility. Um, there is a process, and the short story, the short version is, uh, you know, if you essentially send a bit of a resume, um, if, sometimes it can happen a couple of ways. Uh, you, can, you can be recognized, and then someone may reach out to you from the Orvis con company, or you can, you know, the other way is you can often express interest in, in becoming part, in, an endorsed partner, so to speak. 
Um, regardless, they will come out, they put you through the ropes, they check things out, they talk to clients, references, fish, wildlife, and parks, you know, wardens, the whole nine yards, Scott, uh, and essentially just, um, you know, uh, not essentially, but specifically, um, make sure that you are capable, that your business is capable, that you as an individual, as the outfitter, are capable of upholding a very specific standard. Um, it is written down. It is a it is a formal contract, and um, so so it's something that is well earned. And I don't think that you know it's not to say that um, that um, that, uh, that that there are lots of great guides and outfitters out there that aren't part of the Orvis endorsed program. But I will say this about the program: any, you, you choose anybody, you choose to hunt or fish with somebody in the program, Scott. You know immediately. Uh, that that's been earned and that there's 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 quality there to be to be noted on immediately does, does that make sense you know, it makes all the sense in the world as a tv yep. producer if i'm looking for an outfitter or a lodge that's the first place i go there you go uh, yeah there you go i bet, I'll bet that why. saves you a ton of time right it, that must it, save you a ton of time it yeah. does we have confidence in the organization we know some of the players within the organization it's it's one of those things so yeah, um good for you Yep. Yeah, it works, and I'm I'm glad it's working for you, too. Hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Tim Linehan will be back with us in just a moment, but for a couple minutes, you get to listen to me and only me, so hang loose. Because here's how we pay the bills around here. Talking to Dr. Tim Hunt a lot these days, working on a bunch of videos for him. Dr. Tim's dog food. It's performance oriented dog food. Tim is a musher himself. Yeah, that's a good thing. He's a sled dog racer, but he understands hunting dogs, any performance breed, elite athletes. Dr. Tim's dog food has won the Iditarod race a number of times. He can formulate dog food for specific types of performance one of the things that's really big and you know if you listen to me at all that fat is important me losing it and me giving enough to my dog because energy from fat leads to increased oxidation in muscle i know that doesn't sound intuitive but oxidation leads to a decrease in carbon dioxide in the muscle so it's a good thing Carbon dioxide is what makes a muscle feel fatigued. The right kind of fats are the key, and Dr. Tim has done his homework. He knows what they are. Learn more at drtims.com. Get 30% off your first order. Just use the code Upland Nation, and you will be happy with their home delivery, just like all those other guys, only better because it's Dr. Tim's performance dog food. Speaking of performance dogs, still working on Flick. And the Handle It segment here is where I share what I'm learning the hard way so you don't have to. It's brought to you by Happy Jack Dog Care Remedies, everything for skin coat, parasites, fleas, and ticks. And I love their pad coat. Someday I'll do a testimonial on it at a flawless pad season out there in Chucker Country. All right. So, you know, in thinking about training and talking to all these great pros, uh, one thing I realized that's different between us and them, just like a great teacher of anything, pro trainers anticipate everything. So you're going into a training situation, or even in the field for that matter, which is also a training situation. They have figured out, okay, what can go wrong How do I steer the dog away from those things and towards what I want them to learn? Anticipate all of those things. Prepare for them. I've written about this and I'll talk about it right now. Maximize the former, anticipating, and minimize the chances of the latter, the things that could go sideways. Set up your gear, put your dog in the right place, eliminate distractions, anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. Plan for the worst and hope for the best. That's what puts us apart from all those really good trainers. For what it's worth, good luck.
Tim, would you agree with that philosophy? I certainly would. I, I absolutely would. And, I, you know, I, I, I should back up a little bit, Scott. I, when I say that I don't have time to be a good trainer, I, I have all the respect in the world for the pros. I mean, that's amazing to me. I, I, I didn't want to give the wrong. <laughs> I didn't want to give the. I certainly didn't want to give the wrong idea there. I wish I had a little more time to be a better trainer. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, so don't uh, don't we all though? <laughs> <laughs> that that's Tim Linehan, extraordinary wing shooting guide uh, from the Yak Valley of Montana. FishMontana.com is where you learn more about Tim's operation. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. You know we could. Uh, well, we are. And I, man, I, I'm, I'm so excited to drive through your country, if nothing else, again, this coming fishing season of all times. So watch out. <laughs> I, I'll give you plenty of warnings so you can be away that week. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, l- let's talk about a typical guide day for you guys out there. What, you know, to, how does this all start? Uh, uh, just describe what you go through with a client. Yeah. So the first thing, you know, usually we have people that are staying right here with us. In fact, all of our guests stay with us. I don't really do many, you know, day trips or anything sure. like that, Scott. Yeah. So, so I'll start even I'll start even the evening before. You know, clients will roll in and, and go down and meet them and greet them and say hello, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that's sometimes the sort of precursor. I'll pick them up in the morning and I'll have at least a couple of dogs with me. Um, the nice thing about where I am is we don't have to drive too too far in fact sometimes i'm driving five minutes and and um opening the tailgate and collaring up dogs and and off we go uh so we will typically i would say we do a long hunt in the morning sometimes a little longer because at that time of year as you well know you're getting more of the cool day on more of the cool part of the day you know in the in the morning so yeah, yeah. so we would hunt hard here where i am scott it kind of depends you know how it goes it kind of depends on what you find but i would say Usually two covers, maybe two two different hunts um, in in a morning. That maybe that maybe that's kind of typical. Some are bigger than others, so that kind of depends. Also, you know what I mean. It would also depend on whether we were you know hunting blue grouse. Blue grouse. I often tell people I'm going to put a pack on my back, and that could be all day. We might be up there all day long. Um, but but typically we come back in for lunch. Uh, we're super close to the cabin, super close to our little camp, our lodge right here. Uh, so we might roll back again, and then um, and then head back out. You know, and, and take a take it not not you know take a take at least an hour or so, and maybe wait until the sun is at least off the the top of the day. You know what I mean? And yeah, that that yeah. doesn't take too long in September, as you well know. That's mm-hmm. maybe just two thirty or three o'clock, and then we'll go back out and hunt almost till dark, which is you know seven ish over here in my country. Um, you know, the one thing I look for immediately, and I've done a lot of this way way ahead of time. Um, but we will certainly have the safety talk, and uh, most of my guests are are fairly experienced, and and I've knock on wood never had an issue. But um, but as a guide, um, that's 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 something you just don't overlook. You have the safety talk regardless, Scott. As you, you probably do this, I know you do the same thing before oh, yeah. you start a show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but we go in, you know, a long long hunt in the morning because that's the cool part of the day, and kind of depends if people want to, um, you know, what, what might also play into that is what species they might be looking for. I do have some folks that specifically want to, you know, put a spruce grouse on the wall or a blue grouse on the wall, and this is one of the only, you know, one of the places where they can where they can do that, um, you know, in one hunt. So, but, but the long hunt in the morning and a little, little, little shorter in the afternoon, but we like to put a full day in and, um, and give it everything we got. Leave it all in the field, as they say. <laughs> well, one of our friends at the podcast uh, and a, a colleague at Gun Dog Magazine, Dave Carty, uh, while we know him as a primarily as a prairie bird hunter, he, his his passion is blues. Uh, and, oh, no kidding! And yeah. I, I got to admit, we haven't talked about them much at all. So I'm I'm going to pick your brain on them because they are in in large part completely and totally different than the spruce grouse and the rough grouse in terms of of habitat if nothing else aren't they and you said something that clued me in on this you said we're going to put our pack on our back and we're going to go all day when we go after blues let's talk a little bit about the blue grouse hunt and how it differs any any time one of my, i mean as i said I, you, you grew up in new england you have this um you have this um inherent uh appreciation and love for 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 roughies scott but 
But blue grouse are spectacular, outstanding, and so is the hunt. Um, it, it, uh, the, what, I, what I tell clients specifically, guests specifically, is, sure, guys, we can hunt blue grouse, absolutely, but it's a big day. It's a big hunt. I would, I would think, I would think, Scott. I, I, you and I had this conversation. I've never hunted wild. I've never hunted wild chucker. I, I think it's probably the same physical demand. First, we're going to go find blue grouse. That's what I tell people. First, we're going to go find them, and then we're going to hunt them. And finding them means, in my my area, we live at about 3,500 feet. That means climbing to about 5,000 feet. So, so I literally, I, I mean, that is literally. Uh, I will, I will forgo my you know, my bird bag, so to speak, my vest, and I will literally put a fairly good sized pack on my back and make sure that I've got enough water and supplies for, for guests and everybody else, a much bigger hunt. Um, they're a super interesting bird. They hold really well for, for pointers. They also flush nice and wild, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, and they offer a little bit more shootability, if that's even a word, because they like the tops of the ridges for the most part, and tops of ridges over here in my country tend to be some of the more open areas. For, for, well, for what constitutes open areas in a, in a dense coniferous forest? <laughs> well, and, they're, <laughs> but, um, and they're a bigger target too. <laughs> they, that's exactly that's exactly right. They are, and, and you know they're they're interesting in many ways. You probably know Scott. They're a reverse migrator. They are down in the springtime at lower elevations, and they have their chicks, and then they migrate up in elevation through the late fall and they are at the highest elevation in their lifespan for the year annually during the dead of winter so they're right now blue grouse are up you know five and a half six and a half thousand feet over here in my country they will start to come down in you know whatever june-ish right to have their chicks and then they slowly make their way back up again so super interesting but but I really, really have a great appreciation for them, I think, because you earn blue grouse, at least over in my country, uh, and you can, you, can, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can make a big day of it, which is super, super fun. So I often, you know, ruffies and spruce, and, and let's just stick with ruffies, there's almost, a, there's almost a, you know, in the words of Che Guevara, get in, do the damage, and get out. You hit a cover, and, you, and then you get out again, you know what I mean? And then yep, you go yep. hit another cover, and you get out, you know, Oh, they're, they're not that we didn't find them in this one. We'll try that one again tomorrow. Let's go hit another one, right? That's kind of the roughy, the roughy version of, of uh, hunting. Blue grouse, on the other hand, a little more methodical, a little more, um, a little more committed, a little more, um, a little more, um, uh, a bigger day to that end. Yeah, yeah. in fact, you, you you said committed, and I was going to say almost the same thing. The first hour of a chucker hunt is basically a mountain climbing trip. <laughs> uh, and, and it sounds right. like much right. the same for for blues almost exactly yep you can get lucky once in a while and you find one that's you know down a little lower and you know on the way up but for the most part you hit the nail on the head the first the first hour or two over here in my country um we're just getting there and then you start to hunt okay so so in your pack and this is uh this is um uh, the, your blue blue grouse hunt is when you're prepared for anything yeah. Um, what are you carrying that probably we might not have thought of? I will absolutely carry some sort of um, medical supplies for the dog. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. this country isn't tough on the dog, Scott, but I don't necessarily, I know that if something happens in one of the roughy covers, um, I could throw that dog over my shoulders and we could be out in 20 minutes, really. Yeah. I mean, on yeah. one level, you know what I mean? Um, very, very different with the blues. So I would definitely bring some version of, uh, and I'm no vet, but I, but I could, I could, I could, I could secure a wound, something to secure a wound, something to secure a, you know, um, hope it never happens, a fracture, you know what I mean? So, something yeah. to that end, Scott, where yeah. I could just wrap it up and, and take care of, take care of that, you know, take care of that dog and do the best I could get it out. Frankly, really, that would be the thing. You know what I mean? Get it off yes. the mountain and down into the, you know, down to the truck. That That's sort of, that may be the biggest thing that when I, when I, you know, when I put it back on my back for blue grouse and then water, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of water in this country, but you get up on a, on a, on a blue grouse, you know, Southwest exposure in September and there is no water up there. There just isn't, you know what I mean? It's probably a lot like your country over there in Oregon. So you better have, a lot of water with you, but that, that's no, no secret about that. It's just mm -hmm. about the volume more than anything. Well, yeah. well, let's get on that because that's one of my pet peeves. Um, and I, and, and I've written on the subject a lot about how to carry 
that much water. And you're saying you're, you're putting all this in a backpack within inside the backpack. Where is that? How's that water stored? Yeah. So that's a really, really good question. I've been through it all. I typically now have a version of uh, the big, you know, squirt bottles. I will literally just throw five of those in there. I love those Scott. And then I will supplement those with some sort of bladder, which is just easy to carry. And it carries a, two gallons or something, you know what I mean? So that's typically yeah. what I do. Yep. I'm not, not, you know, nothing special. I don't have a secret there. I just, um, you know, it's, again, it's just as, just as much about volume or it's almost exclusively about volume. And I don't have any issue with, you know, plastic bottles that just are in my pack yeah. because really after that, I tell guys, listen, we'll go, we'll go light on our feet guys. And, and it's mostly water, maybe some, some, you know, some, some, some medical stuff. It, it, that's a kind of a strong word, but mm-hmm. you know, for the dog mm-hmm. in the event that something happens and then 10 power bars, that's it. That's what we, <laughs> you know, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll eat when we get back to the truck. <laughs> uh, the, you know, and, and uh, 20 years ago, I interviewed a great writer. In fact, you, everybody should write down his name, Ted Karasoti. Oh sure, no. You, well. you know Ted. Yeah, no okay, okay, good, no good. Yep. yep. Yeah. No well, hopping. he he used to live down there, uh, right on the on the Yellowstone Park. Yeah, I forgot the name of the town, just on the north end. But anyway, Ted's a great writer and and has a lot of books out. And he said pretty much the same thing. You know, you don't want to eat a lot before or during a hunt. It just slows you right. down, among other things. But um, yep. it also affects your GI tract in ways that you really don't want while you're trying to perform at peak. So, yeah, I agree. and, and, and yep. by the way, your dog as well. Um, but yep. do, do you feed in the morning uh, when you're taking your dogs on a hunt? You, you, you know, so, that, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's another great question. This is all wonderful, Scott. Thanks for having me. Um, Tell your friends at Orvis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 boy, I don't, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear what other guys have to say about this at yeah, some point. Yeah. But I, 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 I usually... I usually let my dogs determine that themselves. And, and, and so, for instance, I never a lot, Scott, but when they get running hard, first of all, everybody is less inclined to want to eat anyway. So, mm-hmm. so Joanne and I have often believed that when they're hungry, I guess I like to feed my dogs when they're hungry. Some mornings they wake up and I can tell they're ravenous, and I will give them a little bit, not a ton. I'll give them a little bit. One of the other things I do carry, though, when you know, particularly especially for a blue grouse hunt, I do like the dog goop. I do love the, you know, I do love, I do, I, I do, I do supplement with those high protein, yeah. um, carbohydrate goop things. Right? I forget the name of them, but I just got the tubes and or the, you know, I'll just throw some into a, into a plastic bag. Or, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And mm-hmm. just, yeah, know, just kind of do that. But, but yeah. So I talked to you know a few other guys. I, I talked to some of my guests that are big dog guys and. And, um, you know, I think if you ask six, six, you know, upland hunters, you'd probably get six different opinions on whether to feed in the morning or not. And, and to answer your question, I kind of let my dogs decide that, but to be sure, never a lot, never yeah. a lot. Yeah, it is all about volume. And that's why some of the, some of the better things, and unfortunately the one I love the most is no longer with us. They won't be importing it anymore, but low volume, high calorie, uh, and yeah. particularly high s- high fat was what what i was after so yep uh, and i've talked about this before but i'll give you one more clue on that one egg yolks oh very good they're almost 100 percent fat and if you can figure out a way to carry them along i put them in a little squeeze bottle that's Um, a great idea scott that's a terrific idea and every dog loves an egg yolk so yep Yep. very very good and that's Uh, no yolk by the way I'll incorporate it. Yeah, I'll yeah. incorporate it this season. I love that. Okay, yep. so so we're talking dogs. We're talking hunting. So, um, besides what we've mentioned already, what is it you love most about that dog hunting grouse pursuit game? What is it that really makes a hair stand up on the back of your neck? I I I still find it. After all these years, and I'm no trainer, Scott, I, my dogs are also lying on chairs, and, you know, I'm that guy, too. They're part of the family. But I still, I still find it absolutely amazing, and this still, to this day, every minute, every single time it happens, I still find it 
unbelievably amazing that a dog can be running through cover at full speed and end up with his nose on a bird. I still find that, and I know, you know, we all know dogs smell a thousand times better than we'll ever smell, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, but that, that piece of it is still, it's this small miracle for me every time it happens, Scott. Honestly, every, every single time it happens to this day after, after 33 years or something like that, I still find it to be a small, unbelievable miracle that I laugh sometimes. I'm just, you know, and, you know, you can see them making game, you can see the tails going, and you can see the posture, and every dog is different, and it's so fun to learn how to read a new dog and get to know things together and learn things together. But when that dog ends up running through a cover at full speed and either, 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 you know, slams to a point or or slows down and starts to do that wiggle, wiggle, sneak, wiggle, wiggle, sneak, wiggle, wiggle, sneak, and then points. I can't even believe it. I just find it unbelievable that, 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 that there's 1.2 million acres and I'm in, you know, they're, they're nose to nose with a rough grouse. I, I, just, I just find that unbelievable. Well, it made me a hunter. I went out and bought a shotgun after the first time I saw that. So uh, right. I'm not going to argue with you about that. Not one dang bit. It, you know, it's hard to be cool and hip. When that happens, I mean, that's right. <laughs> you, you, you just want to exactly. yell something. Don't yeah, right. You? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're nobody, nobody listening to the Upland nation podcast is going to dispute that. And that's why we <laughs> oh, are here. Absolutely. So. Uh, which reminds me that's Tim Linehan. Fishmontana.com is where you learn all about his hunting and his fishing guiding business, Orvis endorsed wing shooting guide. I'm Scott Linden, your host here at the Upland nation podcast, Tim, I know it's a bit of a drive for you, but you know, you start heading down towards twin bridges and then you get over, uh, you know, the grass range or maybe to, uh, you know, some of those other places. Do you ever hunt the prairie birds out there? Oh yeah. Heck yeah. So just for fun. So Joanne I mean, yeah. and I, yeah. What's that? For fun. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't guide over there. Um, but Joanne and I, as soon as we finish, I, so I, so as I said, I usually do about 30 straight days, Scott, um, mid-September-ish to mid-October, and then Joanne and I always take uh, five or six days, and we go to central Montana, which is pretty close for us. We can be over there, obviously, in about six hours, and we will, you know, and we love that. I mean, you, you bet. I mean, I just love it. It's, it's, it's so different. On one level, um, you get to appreciate the dogs a little bit more in a different mm-hmm. way because yeah. you can see them the whole time. You know what, right, Scott? I mean, that's, that's the, what I that's, love. Yeah, I do too. I'll have to confess that at some point I, I, I hope to transition and spend some of the winter months maybe in, you know, uh, doing what you do, you know, a little more open country for a couple of weeks because it's so fun to watch those dogs when you can see them the whole time. The only thing that we miss up here is it's pretty thick and, you know, you're not really seeing you know, seeing the full breadth and width of what a dog is doing throughout the course of a hunt. Yeah. So, so we do, and we love that and, you know, run for Sharpies and Huns and, um, and pheasant over there. And as I said, or way earlier when we started, uh, I'd, I'd hunt sharp tails over anything, any day over on the prairie. I just really, really love them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have that tattooed on my left forearm, by the way. There you go. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, but that brings me back to a question everybody asks me, uh, you know, how can I get my dog to work closer when we're going to go into the grouse woods? C- can you do that? Or do you think you can do that? Or do you just, like you said, buy the breeder? I, you know, there are guys that are way more experienced with dogs than I am and could probably answer this better. But, 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 but based on my experience, I think that you can do that. And I've seen that done. I think, Scott, that, that, that the dogs will learn um, if they have enough time. I don't think it's, it's going to take a little more than a day. You know what I mean, right? I, I have guys come up here and they've got, a, you know, they've got a big ranging English setter. And, well, I just want to see how he does, Tim. I don't have any problem with that at all. This is supposed to be fun to begin with. I, you know, let's just make sure your dog is safe and whatever happens is fine. I don't, I don't care if he misses birds or runs too far out or whatever. But I do, I do see those dogs. I have seen those dogs, dogs like that, that are big running dogs, certainly adjust to the cover. Now, now it takes a bit of handling, that's for sure, right? To your point, Scott, can you teach them? You can. 
I think I think that that with enough days, and I'm not even talking ten days, but more than one, two or three, by the third day of a hunt, even you know I've seen even big ranging dogs work a lot closer. The backing up on all that though, we start as puppies, and you know we, one of the one of the main focuses for for me, and it, because it suits what I'm doing, right? My, my, you know, hunting grouse the way I do it. We start immediately when they're a puppy, and we just call back, call back, call back, call yeah, back, call back. Yeah. We take the dog out for a walk, Scott. I throw my arm straight up in the air. That's call back here, and they get out 30 yards, throw my arm up, 30 yards, throw my arm up. And so my dog cycle, you know, they, they, just, they just get that as a puppy, and it carries on, and it works very, very well. It's interesting when we get over on the prairie. Sure, they'll open up a little bit. They just kind of get that. You know what I mean? But yeah. But but when you know when generally speaking, even on the prairie, my dogs are are hanging pretty close. Yeah. I I never thought about it this way before. But but for you know for a pointing breed in grouse woods, you're training a dog a lot like a guy would train a spaniel. To, to I think that's to right. In, effectively quarter within quote gun range unquote whatever yep. you consider that. It, it, and you just described a little bit of it right there. You know, putting training birds in the right places is how the spaniel guys do it too. But uh, but all of the above, it it does seem to work. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that is that's that's basically what I was trying to articulate. Thanks yeah. for thanks for clarifying. Glad, yeah, very glad to do that. No charge for that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so so we're we're uh, Ruffies, spruce, dusky sooty, blue, whatever we want to call them. We're out there in the woods, and you've handled your dog extremely well, and now all of a sudden, your dog is pointed. Describe what you want us to do as your client and why. Yep, yep. So so things are pretty tight here. The first thing I would have you do, dogs on point, immediately have a look around and see where your partners are. See where I am, make sure you know where your partners are. In spite of the fact that we've been quietly you know, I'm, I'm over here, I'm over here quietly staying in touch, which is one of the things that I sort of require. Uh, a lot of people like to move through the woods with absolute silence. Nope, not me, Scott. I want everyone to know where everybody is, particularly when you're in the thick stuff. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to walk up on, on either side, right? Just, just kind of 10, 15 yards away from that dog. Um, I don't mind if people speak to my dogs. That's kind of okay, too. Whoa, Maggie. Whoa, good girl. Once, once is good. You don't have to, you know, walk in carrying on a conversation. Um, and then stand quietly for a moment, right, after you approach the dog. So walk up 10 yards each side, 5 to 10 yards. I two, usually I'm hunting with two hunters. Mm -hmm. uh, I will always be behind the guns and behind the dog, never out in front of the guns as a guide. And give it a moment, right? Stand still, Scott. I would have you, I would have you stand still, one hunter on one side, one, one hunter on the other side of her. And just give it a moment because, as everybody knows, that's the thing that rough grouse hate the most, right? And, yeah. And spruces, even, let's just say forest grouse, they, they get hinky. Even pheasant, really. Um, they get kind of hinky. So I always have people give it a minute because that can sometimes offer the best shot. If nothing happens, then I just have people move out in front of the dog and, you know, try and flush the bird because the... You know, oftentimes even ruffies are going to skitter away, and sprucers will tend to be very, very close. And for the most part, um, blues, sooty, um, um, they'll 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 be tend to be closer too. But if you know, so 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 kind of depends. But regardless, the you know the 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 sort of dance isn't going to change. Walk up and give it a moment out. You know, right next to the dog. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. You know, give it, give it twenty or thirty seconds, and then wow. if nothing happens, walk through the dog and 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 um, and take it as it comes. Yeah. The suspense is killing me already. I'm only up to seven. <laughs> you know, Thirteen right, more right, counts. Right. No, but yeah. but it, absolutely, I love that idea, and and I'll bet it pays off more often than not. You so, know, it pays off. Yeah, it, it pays off specifically because that's sometimes the best shot. Yeah, if the bird yeah. hasn't moved out ahead, everybody's kind of ready. Everybody's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it, it, it's it's a little more difficult. As you want to know, ruffies are so tricky to begin with, Scott. It's just when you're walking, and that snapshot is even more difficult. So so sometimes you, you, you give it 10, 15, 20 seconds, and that bird just jumps up, or four of them or two of them or whatnot, right? But But that's then... You're, you know, hunters are steady and they're 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 ready, and it's a, it's it is it can be a better shot for sure. Yeah. What is the one thing you hope a, a hunter slash client 
never does when they're hunting with you? Low shot. Yeah. Period. Yep. Just lose their head. Um, and we all have to be careful not to do that because it's very exciting and it's very fun. But lose their head and shoot a low bird, a low flying bird. Yep. And, and we all define low flying differently. There's no blue sky to see between you and the, and the bird uh, in, in the dark woods that you're hunting. So up is better than low. Up is better Super than good. down. Yeah. Super great point, Scott. Super great point. And I typically tell people, unless we're, you know, now there's quite a few things to think about, but generally speaking, uh, I tell people, hold your arm out in front of you, right? Raise it up 15 degrees, nothing lower than that for me ever, 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 ever. That's yeah. just the way it is. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one, one of the reasons I don't guide anymore, but uh, yeah. n- knock wood, I've never had to deal with it. But you mentioned something interesting a few minutes ago. Um, you're always behind the dogs and the and the sports, um, but you've probably mastered the guide crouch. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's leave that one alone. Yeah. You know who's better at it than guides? Cameramen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel sorry for them. Yeah, yeah. I feel sorry for them immediately. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to laugh and neither do you, um, you know, that, that, that is, um, it, it has happened to me on a couple of occasions to, to your point, you're out there. It has happened to you making, making TV. I'm sure it has Scott. It's, 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 um, you know, it, people lose their head. And, and the one thing that never, ever, ever changes the one thing that first, 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 um, uh, as a guide, we're the safety patrol. That's what we are first. And <laughs> then we go hunting, then we go hunting. And I, and I, I really mean that. I mean, I, you know, that's not a, I'm not making light of it. First, I'm the safety patrol for the day, and then I go hunting. Yeah. Is it's absolutely correct. We are hall monitors first and foremost. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. So, very good. Okay. Yeah. So, so that low shots never. No, nope, ever. What's right. What's on the other end of the spectrum? What What would we really, really want clients to always, besides tip really big? Um, <laughs> what else do we want them to do in the field? I. I, I, I I, I, this is going to be more a philosophical answer. I yeah, would want yeah. them to, yeah, I would want them to have fun. Uh-huh. I want them to have fun. I, I remind them that, that sometimes, you know, dogs are, dogs are good some days, dogs are great some days, dogs are, are tired some days, dogs lose focus some days. It's just a little bird. Generally speaking, we're going to find another one. Don't get so intense that you stop having fun. Beyond that, Scott, you're going to miss. You're going to miss rough grouse way more than you're going to hit rough grouse. Yeah. Don't get frustrated. Don't start getting down on yourself. Don't get frustrated with me if we don't find birds. It's supposed to be fun. Quit <laughs> acting <laughs> like a golfer. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you want to carry on like that, go to the golf course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. If you play golf when you're not chasing birds or bird dogs, I apologize. <laughs> right. Me but, too. Me too. But yeah, you me can too. all relate to that if you do play golf and I, I can't, but that's all right. Yeah. Yeah, so, I can't either. You don't, you don't want to get that way with a gun in your hands. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's bad enough to have a blunt instrument, let alone a firearm. <laughs> right. And, and I defy you to break a, a shotgun over your knee like you could a driver. <laughs> exactly. Also, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me that it's been done before. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it has. I've seen pieces fall off, but not because of that. <laughs> Right, right. Okay, so so right. you you see this enough, and then you know this is that kind of stuff. You when you're behind the two sports, you roll your eyes when you're confident they can't see you roll your eyes. What is the biggest mistake we make with our own dogs in the field? Yeah, I so so the biggest mistake that that I think a lot of us make with our own dogs in the field is overhandling. And, yeah. and, and by that, I think what I mean, Scott, is trust your dog. If you have a dog that you've, you've spent some time with, it doesn't have to be, you know, I'm not a pro trainer. I don't spend that much time training my dogs. I spend a ton of time with my dogs, two, you know, two different things. But trust your dog. Um, I see a lot of overhandling. And the reason I think I see a lot of overhandling in, 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 as a guide 
your dogs hunt a lot. My dogs hunt a lot because you and I do this a lot, Scott. But but the average I'm, I'm generalizing. But the average dog may not spend nearly as much time chasing wild birds. Very different from from preserved birds chasing wild birds nearly as much as your dogs or my dogs. So that dog gets here, and and that and, and I see hunters get. Uh, a little bit too manic about trying to control those dogs as if they were at a 57-acre preserve. This is this is this is that's 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 Babe that's Babe Ruth baseball compared to um, Major League, right? That you know what I mean, Scott? Yeah, that, those are two yeah. very very different things. So so voices become elevated, frustration starts to starts to climb. Um, anxiety starts to enter into the situation, both from the dog's point of view, I can see that, and then you know from the client's point of view. So, 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 to straight up, overhandling is one of the biggest mistakes that I think people make, and that is married to dogs that are in a new place, doing a new thing under yep. new circumstances in wild big country. That's what I see. I would add one more thing to that because I've marshaled and gunned and run in, in, in field trials and hunt tests for 25, 30 years. There's performance anxiety and all of that, especially when they bring in your, their dog out in front of a pro like you, they're concerned about what you're going to think of them and their dog and all of those things enter into it that you've described and more but that's a story for another day no no that 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 that's that's actually that's super articulate so let me let me ask you scott what could i do what what could i do i try to make people realize yeah. that ahead of time we have long conversations on the phone before people even get here what else could i do what could i do to remind people that that's not necessary this is supposed to be fun well it, it, right there as, as as we talked about when we arranged this whole interview, it, it is supposed to be a, a good time for everybody, including the dog. Uh, the other thing, when I was in the music business a lot, we'd look at each other as the curtain went up or as we walked on stage and we'd say, well, too late for anything else. You know, it is what it's going to be. Yeah, so, terrific. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, cross your fingers. Um, like I've said before, hope for the best and plan for the worst, but hope for the best. And, uh, yeah. it, you know, like you said, have a good time. The dog's going to screw up. You're going to screw up. You're going to, you're going to screw up more than the dog. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, Very and, good. No, okay. And, yeah. and nobody cares. See, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is yep. not a test. Uh, this is yep. not, you know, nobody's going to, uh, unless you're on TV, then it is a test, but that, <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, beside, uh, we, we got to wrap it up here at the Upland Nation podcast. That's Tim Linehan. You can learn more about all of his guiding efforts. Orvis endorsed wing shooting guide, fishmontana.com. I know it's counterintuitive, but he does both, which is, you know, that's why I started my first TV show, Cast and Blast. But that's right. right. All, about, all about our lifestyle, Tim. Yep. But yep, um, I remember. So besides talking to me today, Leave us with this. What has been the highlight of your day? Let's see. Highlight of my day was uh, earlier this morning, I think I sold a big game hunt. So I know Woo! that's maybe a strange thing to say, but yeah, a business, that business is the necessary part of it, Scott. But um, we, had a couple, we have a couple more hunts to fill, and this would be our deer elk season. And um, 99% sure I wrapped one up this morning and we're almost closed out for, for the fall. That feels good. Yep. Oh, yes, it does. We all, you know, anybody who's in business for themselves knows what a great feeling that is. So congr yeah. congratulations. Thank Glad you. Glad to hear it. Yeah, learned it. Just a pile of stuff here. I mean, I'm going to have to digest this for a while, but um, very helpful stuff. Tim Linehan, fishmontana.com. Uh, great stuff. Everybody... I'm sure you're in the same boat I am. Thank you so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Greatly appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'm humbled. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow. Yeah, that's going to take a while to digest, and that's the joy of podcasts, I guess. You can, you can listen over and over and over again, and please do tell your friends. 
Speaking of podcasts, we've got a lot more to talk about. Well, just a little bit more, okay? I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. This is running a little bit long, but boy, it was worth it, at least in my estimation. A couple more things, including This Land is Your Land. I got some recommendations on a place to go. But first, do you get the Upland Nation Insights newsletter? You know, in the subject line, it says Weekend Essentials, and then it tells you what's in there. And hopefully there's something in there all the time that's of value to you in one way or another, including the weekly reader poll. Curiosity kills the cat, but I was really interested because I've been using RVs to travel to hunting destinations all over the country for a long time. So for some other reasons I'll talk about soon, um, I thought I'd ask you all, do you own an RV? Interestingly, about 30% do and 70% do not. So the bigger question is when you go hunting far away from home, what do you do? And, you know, we'll talk about that in the future as well. Camp, hotel, stay up all night, reloading, whatever it is. But anyway, very interesting insight there and uh, more to come on that in the very near future. And maybe you're going to go to one of these places with your RV or without your RV. This Land is Your Land is brought to you by FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. That's where you get more and more detailed information on the topics that we talk about here. Wild birds, wild places, free walk-in, public access hunting areas for you to visit. Plus some dog training and dog care advice, gear, etc., etc., one of the unsung quail states, unless you know somebody from the area who is pretty darn proud of it, and I'm thinking of you, Jim, right now, Oklahoma. They have a relatively new program. We were there the first year they opened up this Oklahoma Land Access Program. They call it OLAP. Made a show there. On top of the OLAP, which are basically just like everybody else's walk-in areas, you just find them on the map and you go. Some of the wildlife management areas that really pay off for bobwhites in northwest Oklahoma. Here's the short list. Optima, Cimarron Hills, and Beaver River wildlife management areas. All great starting points. The hard work is up to you. Remember, you kill birds with shoe leather, not with shotguns. And the bonus is, sometimes you might bust up a little blue quail once in a while. That's the signal for me to say goodbye to you. Thank you again for listening. I'm Scott Linden, your host here at the Upland Nation Podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and rate us at Apple Podcasts. Check in anytime at the Upland Nation and the Wing Shooting USA Facebook pages. That's where all the discussion starts and quite often continues for a long time. But that's all right. I want to thank Grove Folk for the positive review at Apple Podcasts very recently. And I'll leave you with this point to ponder from well-known author, in our world at least, Corey Ford. Corey says, properly trained, a man can be dog's best friend. Good dog. Good human. It's a two-way street. Thanks again for listening. Until next week, talk to you on the Facebook pages.